Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the North Dakota State University 2018 Spring Fever Garden Forums. My name is Tom Kolb. I'm an extension horticulturist based in Bismarck. And tonight I'm joined by Bob Birch, a web technology specialist in the Department of Ag Communications. And Bob's in our recording studios on campus. Tonight is Forum One, and it's on the last day of winter. And as you all know, winter has delivered a snowy blast to us. That winter does not want to go away, it looks like, but tonight we are going to think spring. We got the fever. And our focus tonight is going to be on fruits and vegetables. Tonight we will have three brief presentations, about 20 minutes each, and then after each presentation, we'll take your questions. Okay, so, and we invite your full participation and uh, we're so glad you're, you're here with us tonight. Let's get started. Now, I have to say one of the most fascinating research projects in North Dakota is the Northern Hardy Fruits Evaluation Project that's based in Carrington. And our first speaker, Kathy Wiederholt, is the manager of this project. Kathy tends to an amazing variety of fruits, uh, many of which are underutilized in North Dakota. Tonight, Kathy's going to share with us her thoughts on black currants. So, Kathy, welcome to the forum. Hi, Tom. Let's see. There we go. Everyone can probably see me. I'll try to back up a little. I can't adjust my camera. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone. Yep, I'm the fruit project manager. We've been doing this fruit project since 2006. Um, seems hard to believe it's been about 12 years now. Um, all of our plants are getting pretty mature and it's just really, uh, uh oh, not hearing Kathy. Let's see, somebody else isn't hearing Kathy. Um, anyway, uh, our plants should be getting quite mature now. And we, we actually are removing some and putting in some other ones and then um, just kind of just going with the ones we have just, just, just to see how they're doing long term with our weather here. And that's really the whole um, purpose for the project is to see how they'll do in the long term because who wants to plant a fruit plant and then have it only live a couple of years. So uh, we can say everything here is quite, quite hardy. So let's talk about the currants. They are one of my favorite fruits. Um, a plant you have to get used to a little bit. Oh, there's my presentation. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> so black currants. Let's see. We'll get into the next slide. There we go. Uh, this is basically what the currants look like on the left-hand side. Uh, black currants, and then there's red currants and white currants. Red and white currants. They're actually the same species. They're just um, just a weird color variant to get the white or <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes there's champagne color, they call it, or slightly pink, but uh, really they're all variations from the red currant, which is just interesting. The white aren't as tart as the red. The red are a little more tart. Those are mostly used for uh, jellies, maybe some wines for the red currants, but really a lot of jellies. They have quite a lot of seeds, uh, and they're pretty tart, but in other parts of the world, they're used for a snack on the table. Uh, you know, the northern, the northern countries like... Um, Finland and Sweden and Norway and up in Russia, they might not be used to as much sugar as we are. And so these are actually set out as fresh snacks on the table. So on um, the left hand side, the black currants, that one is, it's, it's more unusual than the other two fruits. It has um, kind of a more uh, stronger flavor. It's very intense. You uh, probably won't forget it once you taste it. So, well, let's go on and then we'll talk about this some more. I do want to mention the gooseberries. Uh, just because they're in the same genus, they're a whole different species, and you can see they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes, really. There's red ones, there's these blackish red colored ones, more purple, and these on the bottom left-hand side, they're more... Um, I don't know, a teardrop shape, I guess you'd call them, a uh, little, little smaller on the top and bigger on the bottom. Um, in the middle, this is a reason that it's a little bit hard to grow gooseberries. Um, whoops, because of the thorns. There's a very sharp, 
sharp thorns on each each branch and a um, little hard to pick those. Uh, all right, another reason we do not grow many currants is probably because of these leaf diseases and then, um, so there's things like anthracnose and other kinds of diseases. And on the bottom left hand side is powdery, or excuse me, right hand side, um, powdery mildew. Um, a lot of the current, or excuse me, the gooseberry plants are susceptible to powdery mildew. And we lose a lot of uh, leaves because of that. By the end of the year, they have almost no leaves. So anyway, the fruit project has kind of removed the gooseberries now. We will not kind of, we actually have. Uh, we had cut them down from 52 plants down to uh, eight plants at one time. And now we've actually got rid of all of them because uh, I needed more room for Hascap study. They kind of ripen at the same time currants do, but they're not as valuable. So uh, we just decided to remove all of them. All right. Well, currants are important. They are popular all around the world, except in the United States. Uh, but they are popular mainly because of their high vitamin C content. Uh, black currants, uh, they say like it's some of the highest vitamin C, three to four times higher than oranges when you go on a pound for pound basis. But I don't think you'll eat that many black currants at once. Um, 73 to 444% of the amount of vitamin C that a, that an orange has. So that is a lot. Uh, so they also have different vitamins. You can see vitamin A and there's some B vitamins, and niacin in there with the B vitamins. Uh, so one of the one of the fruits that kind of holds a lot of minerals and good nutrition for you. Uh, they're very high in flavor. Uh, um, what is it? Antioxidants in fruit would be the easiest way to see it to say it. Um, all the purple compounds in your fruits, black currants are very high in those. So, so one consequence of having the high vitamin C is the tartness that the fruit has. But black currants are sweet tart. They are both sweet and tart, uh, but perhaps a little stronger than some fruits that you know. Um, I can tell you that the first time my husband tried them, he spit them out. So, um, so much for that. But now he loves them. You just got to get used to them a little bit. Well, the center of current biodiversity, like where do they really come from? It's really the northern areas of the Asian continent, you know, um, Russia, northern Russia, uh, and then more to the more to the west into Finland and Sweden and Norway. And they there's many there's there's different species there and they're actually breeding some plants but from the they're kind of um Oh, what would I say? They're intercrossing different species into the into the black current ge um, genetic pool, just so they can get different resistances to diseases. But this is where they're hardy. So if they're hardy there, for sure they're hardy in uh, Carrington, North Dakota, or many places in North Dakota. All right. So I said that the United States does not really know about black currants. Um, all, almost all production in the, in the world comes from Europe and Russia, a lot of it from Poland. Poland is a huge fruit, uh, fruit producer. And uh, so here in the U.S., I read this in one paper from Cornell, and I actually can't find it anymore, but I have it copied. Uh, in 1899, there were over 12,000 acres of black currants here in the U.S. Uh, they were produced commercially. So by 1910, though, I mean, in 10 years, commercial cultivation was banned in the U.S. And the reason for this was uh, when they cut down all the white pine trees for timber in the eastern part of the U.S., they needed to replant those trees with little seedlings. But the United States didn't have nurseries for growing little seedlings, se seedlings but Germany did. So they imported plants from Germany and probably other places in Europe and brought them to the U.S. Well, those plants had white pine blister rust spores on them. And so it was actually the white pines that brought the blister rust into the United States. But it was the currants that suffered. Uh, the currants were not valuable compared to timber. 
And so something had to give, right? And so it was the currents. They, they were removed. Um, a big push by agricultural, uh, the Department of Ag and stuff for the United States, extension agents helped in this, conservation, uh, the like CCC type groups, they were in on this, going around, digging up current plants, even trying to eliminate them from the wild. But no one can eliminate all the plants, none of the, um, some of the other currents we have here in the U.S., some, we have wild gooseberries in the U.S., and uh, things like that. So we could never get rid of it all, but they did reduce the amount of, uh, of the disease in the U.S., and then the pines were able to get older, kind of have a multi-generational um, population of pines, older ones and younger ones, so then the disease was not as bad as it was uh, back then. So, but currants were banned until I think 1966. You couldn't plant any in the U.S. And then now it has been turned over to the states, and it is the state's job to regulate the currants in their in their state. And there's still, I think, maybe six states that don't allow you to grow currants. Um, but there are white pine blister rust resistant varieties of currants, and um, so they can be planted, but you just have to look at your own state regulations. No regulations against currants here in, in North Dakota. Uh, we don't really have almost any populations of white pines. There are a few here and there, but they have to be pretty close. Uh, the disease travels from currants to white pines about um, about a thousand feet. You have to keep them separated. But from the pines, they come to the current plants like a couple hundred miles. And our plants actually get white pine blister rust, even though there are no white pines to bring it to them in the area. So they're coming, it's coming through the air, it's traveling in the wind, and then we get the we get that in our, our plants here in Carrington. So kind of funny. All right, let's look at the US production, right? Um, uh, the, the world and U.S. Uh, current production is pretty different. World production, um, 551 metric tons of currents. That's a lot of fruit. That's a lot of currents. You can see the top producers, Germany and Poland. Uh, again, they produce a lot of our fruit. Germany does too, but Poland Poland's a really a top producer of fruit. Um, Where's the U.S. in this? If you look way at the bottom in, in the black type, the United States, 50 metric tons. And, I, you know, I have to say I don't know what year this was from, this, this data, and I wasn't able to find a good source uh, just to check and see a recent claims. But I know it is growing in the U.S. It's still not a lot. There's someone in Connecticut that has uh, quite a few acres, and he picks them and processes them for juice, and they're sold in um, – in grocery stores on the East Coast. There are production sites in British Columbia, in Oregon. Uh, I know there's uh, some production in uh, Saskatchewan, but uh, not really huge, but still several acres, you know, uh, needs to be mechanically harvested. So still the poor United States, we're, we're behind on currents, I think. All right, here at the research center, we have, um, as I said, we have the black, red, and white currants. And we actually have eliminated the white currants because we don't really have a use for them. Um, if it's, if we don't want to, if we don't really have a great use for them, it's not really worth our time to pick them. And we've had them for a long time and we have really good data on them. But so now we're just looking at the black and the red currants. And you can see on this slide that black currants don't produce quite a, quite a bit. They produce uh, about three to nine pounds of fruit per plant. That's kind of, that's our dry land production. We don't irrigate too much. Uh, we do have a small section that does get irrigated, but uh, for the most part, it's uh, dry land. And then the red currants, uh, 10 to 20 pounds per plant. I mean, this is a lot of fruit. 20 pounds of currants is, the whole plant is just red and green. It's really gorgeous when, it, uh, when it's nice and ripe. So uh, it's not unusual. We get 10 pounds almost every year, and then the 20 pounds we just got this last year. Um, some years we've gotten 15, so a lot of fruit. All right, um, what are our problems here? And I think I'm, I'm going to elaborate on this in a couple more slides. Um, possible spring frost. They, they, they start to bloom and grow quite early. And uh, 
So that's one concern for them. And then, um, and then hand harvesting. And I'll show you a picture of us doing that too. Oh, there it is. Uh, <laughs> there's me. Uh, I took this from a video that we made. Uh, that in my hand is a piece of black plastic pipe. It's a water pipe. It's about three feet long. Um, it extends behind my hand there. And if you lay some sheets down, and you hold the end of the branch in one hand and then you take your stick or your tubing and you start beating the plant. You just start hitting the branch and the berries start flopping around and the, the branch starts flopping around and pretty soon everything's moving and the berries just pop off the stems really quite easily. And it's a really nice quick method to harvest these berries. We have picked a lot of currants by hand before learning this a couple years ago. And uh, it took about 45 to 60 minutes to pick one shrub. But I bet you could pick uh, one shrub in about 10 to 15 minutes now, depending on how cleanly you harvested the berries. So a nice, easy method to use. All right, here's going back to our concerns in North Dakota. Um, the early warmth in, in 2012, on the left-hand side picture, in 2012, it was in the 50s and it was in the 60s almost the whole month of March. And then in April, it cooled down just a little bit. And then around the 20th of April, maybe slightly before, we had, I think, I want to say like 17, 18, and 19 degrees for three nights in a row. That really hurt a lot of the current, not a lot, but certain varieties of the current plants. We still got a crop on some, but you can see in that picture, there's dead branches, and then there's some that are trying to leaf out. But this variety was called Hilltop Baldwin and it was very susceptible to, the, to that freeze. It was um, like the, the cambium, that inner layer of the, of the plant was injured, and so it just couldn't live after that. Uh, on the right hand side in 2015, our weather was just cool and wet. It was probably in the upper four, mid 40s to 50, I would say, and it misted or rained almost every day. The bees couldn't fly. And I have read that the plants are susceptible to cool weather when they're in blossom, when it gets below 45 or 46 degrees. So that is what happened. Um, this is after blossom period. I just touched all those, uh, you know, kind of rubbed them with my thumb, touched those blossoms, and they all fell off in my hand. Uh, so we got no crop in 2015. Kind of a bummer, but uh, it happens. All right, and the other problem we have is current borer. Uh, you can see on the left-hand corner, there's the black pith in the stem, and then there's a little white uh, right in here. I don't know if you can see my... Uh, cursor but I'll circle it there is a white grub in there and that he has survived over the winter and then what would happen is in the early kind of early early summer late spring early summer it finishes pupating and it turns into an adult and then it it gnaws its way out and the the lower left hand corner there's a little d-shaped hole uh, kind of the similar hole to our emerald ash borer <laughs> but this is a current borer and this is where the adult came out and what happens is later they will lay their eggs in the petiole, uh, where the petiole meets the stem. They'll lay an egg in there, and then the, the little tiny borer will bore in and then go down all summer. He'll spend his summer going down the pith, eating away. So on the right-hand side is how a, a branch kind of looks when it has uh, a borer damage. I say it looks like it has more flower than leaf. Uh, you, you do see a lot. You, you see the flowers. It still it still wants to have fruit. It puts out a lot of blossoms, but the the leaves stay very very small. So they just look kind of puny. And really, the only goal for current borer uh, that homeowners and really commercial uh, there are some sprays, but it's just terrible to have to use them. Um, they just prune out these very poor stems, and then um, that removes it. You, prune them out and you burn it and then that little white grub he kind of sizzles up in there I suppose so and I, I don't feel sorry for him one bit so too bad for him <laughs> uh, last problem we see is the white pine blister rust on the left hand side is how the rust looks on the back side of the leaf on susceptible varieties but remember there are varieties that we can grow that are not susceptible and then on the right hand side is what happens to the trees and this disease can really get into the uh, 
under the bark of the of the tree and kind of girdle it and it would kill it. It is very damaging for the white pine trees. So if you live where there's white pine trees, your neighbor has one, you should try to grow a resistant variety of currant. All right, planting the currants. Um, you know, full sunlight, as always, for most uh, things that want to flower or fruit, um, so full sunlight, I believe, is eight hours a day. Uh, ours get whatever they get the whole day, um, whatever North Dakota gets. They're in the sunlight. And then they, you know, kind of average good soils. They like, uh, they, they, they say they're heavy feeders. So if you have a soil with good organic matter, that would be great. You don't want the soil too wet, but uh, you, they do like moisture. And then... Um, they would prefer to not have too high of a pH of soil. Here at Carrington, ours is about 7.4 or 7.5, and we don't see too much chlorosis on them. Once in a while, uh, a stem here and there. But really, it, I think it could be fixed with um, um, an iron chelate spray or a drench or something like that, maybe working a little sulfur around the plants. Uh, that would be okay. So anyway. When you get your plants, you will plant them about three to four inches deeper than they came, uh, like, like where they were originally potted up. You will see a, um, see a little root ball in the stem, and you want that stem planted three to four inches uh, deeper than where the root ball was. And so you uh, put the soil back over it, and then you will prune whatever is sticking up out of the ground. You will prune it to about two to three buds. And this encourages the, the dormant buds down below to come out, and you're going to get a nice, thick, bushy plant. And they won't be spindly. It will grow nicely. And if it didn't grow well the first year, the next year, cut it back down, and you're just, you're just asking those lower buds to grow. You know, over the winter, most of the energy in a hardy plant, in a woody plant, is in the roots, not so much in the stems. So when you prune in early, early, early spring, late winter, uh, late winter is the best time to prune, uh, you'll just get rid of the things you don't want, and then the energy can go to the things you do want. So it works out pretty nicely. So we mulch our plants. We... Um, I uh, use a, just a wood chip mulch, and then we remove weeds by both hand weeding, and then we'll do some spot spraying of herbicides to just kind of help us out there and keep the weeds down. And this is just a quick picture here, uh, pruning currants. This is a picture I use in my pruning talk, and what you're doing is renewal pruning. You are removing older branches, things you don't want. You're going to be removing those at the ground level, and then you'll have a plant that is thinner. You'll have more light going through it, more air going through it. That will help prevent diseases in currants. And let's see. Oh, oh, this is just a picture of currants. Uh, the one on the left has not been pruned yet, and the one on the right has been pruned. So you can see that it's much more open after pruning. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to exactly see because you're looking one-dimensionally at a three-dimensional object. So, But it is definitely thinner than the one on the left. And let's see if this works. Um, I don't know. Oh, it won't work. Um, those... Uh, those colors on there. I had them come and go on the slide, but uh, one thing I want to show you is that here, these green lines are very small and spindly, and if you, you know, they're never going to do well. They're always going to be in the shade, so you would remove the green line, the, the, the little stems that are un under the green lines. Just nip those off right at the ground, and then on the left-hand side, um, there's a yellow uh, line that's going upward. Well, that is really growing kind of backwards into the plant, you know, like the, it's growing, the, the plant should be opening upward and outward, but this is going to kind of cross over. So that's one I removed. And on the right hand side, I've got a circle and I've circled that I've just removed it. So you can remove things at the ground, you can re remove things inside, you just want to open up the plant and get many, get several year classes of plants, the, the light colored uh, the light colored stems are last year's plants, last year's growth. And then the dark colored ones are maybe two year old wood. And then you can see some glowing red on some of those stems on the right hand side. And that's the bark kind of peeling a little. And that indicates an older stem. So uh, you want to keep younger, middle aged, and a little bit older, not too old. The oldest ones won't produce. So you can uh, prune them every year, is the most helpful thing you can do for them. 
All right, and the last thing I have for you, so I don't expect you to write this down, but you can, we'll, they're recording this, and um, I don't know if the PowerPoints will be available uh, one by one, but um, this is my recipe for black currant jam, is actually from England, how it would be made by a person in England, and it's very easy, the fruit's there, you soften it up by simmering it with some water, and then uh, when it seems soft after 20 or 30 minutes, you add sugar and you let the sugar dissolve in the warm liquid, and then um, you bring it to a boil and turn it into, gel into jam. So uh, my very favorite jam stands up to peanut butter. Um, it's actually quite thick because currants have so much pectin, and uh, you can add other fruits to it. You could add strawberries, you could add raspberries. I add hascaps because I have hascaps, um, and that makes it really, really good. So. So there you are, a good recipe for currants. And my last slide is just my contact information and a beautiful apple blossom there for you to, to pine for. Um, it's still snowing here in Carrington right now, so and I think it's probably snowing in Fargo. So, all right, I am ready for questions. Okay, thank you, Kathy. And now it's time for your questions. We got a few already for you, Kathy. How about black currants? Do they resist deer or rabbits? You know, they do resist deer, and I'm not sure about rabbits, but I would think so. The stems of black currants have oil glands on them, and it's uh, the polite thing to say is a heady, herbaceous aroma. I think that's in a handout. Um, but it really smells like cat pee. That is about the only way to describe it and uh, the most descriptive way to describe it, I guess. Anyway, I was just talking to people who have different kinds of plants and they have current plants and they, without a fence, you know, and we have a fence, um, but they said, yeah, the deer don't care for the current plants because of those, those um, I guess, pungent oils on the stems. Okay. That's deer will try anything, though. They will try anything at least once. If they're starving, huh? Yeah. So do the flowers have a pungent, that, that uh, cat pee smell? No. The, okay. well, you probably can't distinguish them from the leaves and the, and the branch smell, but I don't think the flowers really have much of a scent. There are some currants that are called clove currants, and they're a different species, and they actually do have a wonderful scent. It still smells just like cloves in the air. You know, Kathy, there's a, a lot of questions, I think. Are those the golden currants you're talking about? It would be golden currants, Ribes or Ribes odoratum. Um, so there's a lot of people who are interested in our audience with those golden currants because they're so widely available from the Soil Conservation District. Do you recommend the golden currants? You know, we we have had them here. And they ripen kind of not so much at once. They kind of ripen over some time. They're kind of a steely blue-black color. It's kind of neat. And they're, they're actually pretty good to eat fresh because they don't have this strong acidic flavor that black currants have. So I would recommend them as something to snack on in the yard. Uh, you could use them in some kind of like a fruit salad or something. But the one thing is I try to make currant jam with them the same way I make this other currant jam. And the berries just turned out like raisins, like really hard raisins in the jam. They didn't soften like I expected them to. So that's that's all I can tell you. They also um, they have little stolons underground, and they will kind of spread a little. So uh, if you don't want them to spread, you'll you know if you've got a, if you've got grass, you can mow them off, but they will spread somewhat. So they're a little bit more aggressive. Are they are they yes. taller too? Is that a little bit taller? Um. Maybe five feet tall. Maybe just slightly taller. Kind of just depends. Okay. I would say similar sized. Okay. The questions are coming in with a flurry now, so oh, here we go. Yeah. Um, okay. This uh, person purchased black currants from All Seasons Nursery a few years ago, and they got the boar, probably that girdler, huh? And so she she double bagged the plants, pots, and put them in the trash. How can she pre prevent getting these borers in her plantings in the future? Well, she just no. I would say, I would luck. say, you cannot prevent the borers. Uh, you can just prune them out, and uh, they, like I said, they spray for them commercially. But the problem is, at the time the 
it's a clear winged moth is what the name of the adult is. At the time the moth is in there laying the eggs, there is so much, um, <clears throat> there's so much new growth. They're putting up new growth from, uh, from the base. And so it's really such a tight area. You really can hardly spray for them. And, and for homeowners and for commercial, they just recommend pruning out the area that has the borer and then just disposing of that in the trash, burning it, but getting it out of the landscape. And then the plant will regrow from the It crown. could regrow. Yeah. So that, lead, that leads to a question that somebody has, a, oh, an old black currant from Montana, and uh, the plants are old and scraggly. So can she just whack them off? At, what would you do, whack them off at what, a foot or three inches or something? And I would advise whacking them off to like three inches tall. And so and she, 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 when, when could she expect some fruits then? Um, it would take two years then to get fruit. They fruit on like one year old wood. They fruit the next year after it grows. Okay. Um, when's the best time to do the pruning in general? Before the buds start to push out. So March and April is really a good time to do the pruning. Okay. So right now. Perfect. Right now, yeah. When the snow melts. <laughs> How about, have you seen much rust on any of the cultivars that you grow there at Carrington? Yes, we get rust. Uh, in the old trial, there was only two varieties that, did, that were resistant to the rust, and they did not get it. But the other ones got rust almost every year. One year, they didn't, and uh, I found that, you know, nice, I guess. But the rust usually happens after we pick the fruit. And so it really doesn't bother the current plants. Their life cycle is pretty much complete once you've harvested the fruit because they start so early in the year. And uh, the leaves look terrible. They, they will even fall off, it, uh, like sometime at the end of August, so the leaves could fall off. But the plant comes back the next year like it hasn't even had a problem. So And the rust cannot reinfect the plant from those leaves. It actually has to go to the white pine tree and then back to the current plant. And like I said, from the from the plant, from the current to the tree is, is like a thousand feet. But from the tree to the current is several hundred miles. So it's not gonna matter like where that tree is. It's it'll find your your current plant. So even if there's so few white pines in North Dakota. Yep. We get it every year. And if it was a moist year, I think a moist year, and if you get a lot of east winds or wherever you can get the, I mean, mostly Minnesota would have the white pines. There's a few here and there in North Dakota, um, but they would be planted by someone. They wouldn't be wild. But yeah, we, we get it every single year. And one year was bad that we got the rust before we harvested, but that was probably about eight years ago. Okay. How about uh, currants attract moles? Do they attract <laughs> moles? I moles, don't think so. The animals. I don't Do they, think so because they, they are don't like stinky. Eat currants. Where's a good place to buy black currant stock? You know, um, of course, not recommending a, a, a place, but uh, we do use a the place we really like to use is called Whitman Farms, a lady named Lucille Whitman, and she's in Oregon, and she has wonderful little uh, rooted cuttings. I mean, they're not little. They're about 10 inches, 12 inches tall. They have a nice root mass on them, and she'll package them up and send them to you, and uh, very reasonable. Okay. And a good selection. Oh. Okay. How can you tell which stems to prune during the dormant season that especially that may have the bore? You look for the bore holes or Yeah, you know, you 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 won't be able to tell what they are um, when they're dormant. You can see the slow, spindly, kind of piddly growth after a while. Like in early May, you'll see you'll see that some of those are slow. And then you just keep pruning until you don't see the black anymore. But um, older stems will have more chance of getting a current, getting the borer. Um, and the ages, the other question was the ages, what, what are the, how to tell the ages. Uh, the first year's growth is straight. It's probably, hopefully, about at least two feet long. It looks nice and sturdy, bigger than a pencil. 
uh, and it is straight and it is kind of a silvery gray color. And then the next year it gets a little darker uh, when it's two years old and it has a little bit of side branching. And by the third year, the, the, the bark is darker and there's even more branching. It's a fuller plant. And really you want to remove the four-year-old shoots for sure. So whatever looks really old, it'll have a nice thick mass to the cane, um, a, a diameter, a thick diameter. Remove those old things and then you just kind of want a selection of new and old. Just kind of mix it up. What causes the leaves to pucker or have blisters? And, yeah, and, and the puckering and blistering. It's from aphids. It's from some current aphids. And uh, really, you can control that in a home situation. You could spray off the leaves, spray under the leaves with water. You could use um, safer soap. That would be something really great against aphids. Uh, probably pyrethrin sprays, but I am not sure on that. Um, but for sure, a safer soap works really well on that. It doesn't really hurt the plant. It just kind of distorts it. Uh, although, I had someone tell me that they had aphids so bad that they removed their plants. So that's the only time I've ever heard that. Mm. You have them, but, but it's not a concern to the plant. But generally, it's not damaging for fruit production. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, how about, can you, do you want to talk about your field day? You always have a field day. Oh, yeah. Well, our field day, let me quick peek here. Um, July 17th is the date I believe field day is, the third Tuesday in July. And we are going to focus on aronia this year. We'll have uh, either myself or we'll have someone come uh, and talk about aronia. Okay, another question. Okay, that, that's always a great thing, by the way. Um, that's it's so cool to see all those. Oh, yeah, so we'll have a tour of the plants, and then, um, and probably the person, the featured speaker about Aronia will speak first, and they'll talk for about an hour or so, and then the other hour and a half, we can just wander around and look at things, and if it's ripe, you can taste the fruit, and um, have a good time. So, another person has a question about pine trees, and the pine trees are uh, within a thousand feet, so... It, well, it's got to be a white pine. You, yeah, it's got to be a white miles, pine. Hundreds of miles, even white... Minnesota. <laughs> so forget it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, got to get resistant pine, material. Point, it's not damaging to the current plant, but it's damaging to the pine. So you should look at your pine and see if the if the needles are in bundles of five. So the letter white has five letters and the white pine bundles are in bundles of five. So five there, five. <laughs> and uh, that's when you can have that uh, passing back and forth. I think, uh, I think the handout tells you in our website, the, Carrington, Re uh, the uh, Carrington Research Extension Center on the Northern Hardy Fruit part of that uh, has some recommendations for plants and two plants that we know that do not get white pine blister rust are Titania, and one called, you're going to hate this, Minaj Smiru. And uh, you better look for that name. I don't want to spell it. Yeah, but they're resistant, the and then they, they won't transmit the disease. Okay. Any last questions for Kathy? Last call for questions. Okay. See none. Okay. Kathy, thank you for getting us off to such a great start. And uh, yeah. in forums. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Have a great spring. Okay. All right, everybody. We're going to take a short five minute break and then we're going to talk about how to start seeds indoors. So, a five minute break. <laughs> 